Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Tony Rothschild. I'm the chair of the Grand Rounds Committee. Just a couple of brief announcements. In order to receive credit for attending today's Grand Rounds, um, you have to complete the survey, the evaluation, which was sent with the Grand Rounds announcement on Monday um, by Karen Lambert. And there's a Survey Monkey link to fill out the evaluation. Grand Rounds is going to be on Zoom for the rest of the year, um, but we're hoping in September to be back in person. Um, if you have questions for today's speaker, please type them in the chat function and I will direct the questions to her at the end of her talk. Next week's Grand Rounds uh, will be given by Dr. Jordan Smoller, who is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and director of the Psychiatric and Neurogenetics Unit and the MG, at the MGH Center for Genomic Medicine. The title of Dr. Smoller's talk next week is an update on the genetics of psychiatric uh, disorders. It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, a uh, longtime uh, colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Susan uh, McElroy. Dr. McElroy uh, uh, received her bachelor's from Colgate University and then her MD from Cornell University Medical College. She then did a uh, internship in internal medicine at Presbyterian and then uh, did her psychiatry residency at um, McLean Hospital in Belmont, where she also had fellowships, um, uh, including the Ethel DuPont Warren Fellowship and was a research uh, fellow in psychiatry. She um, sort of rose through the ranks of Harvard Medical School and then through the ranks of the University of Cincinnati where she is now the Linda and Harry Fath Endowed Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science uh, with tenure. And she has been since 2008, the Chief Research Officer of the Linder Center of Hope in Mason, o Ohio. She's won a number of different awards. There's no time to go through them all, I'll just mention a few. Uh, she was the co-recipient in 1993 of the Gerald Clareman Young Investigator Award of the National and Manic Depressive Association, and she's also in top, um, top doctors. Dr. Uh, McElroy, if you look at her CV, is a prolific researcher and, and publisher, and she has a lot of research interests, um, um, including in bipolar disorder, kleptomania, pathological gambling, impulse control disorders, body dysmorphic disorder, eating disorders, obesity, which will be the subject of today's lecture, and the relationship among eating disorders, major mood disorders, and um, obesity. She's on a number of uh, editorial boards, and she's uh, the associate editor of the Journal of Clinical Psychopharmacology. As I'm sure you'll see today, she's an outstanding uh, teacher. Dr. McElroy has authored or co-authored 460 uh, original um, uh, publications, 160 book chapters or reviews, and co four books, and hundreds of published abstracts from scientific meetings. So let's give a, a warm virtual welcome to Dr. McElroy. The title of her talk is Mechanisms and Management, Psychiatric Disorders, and Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Rothschild, for that incredibly kind um, introduction. Dr. Rothschild is one of my mentors, so a little nervous about this talk, but let's get started. So I'm going to talk about basically the relationship between psychiatric disorders and obesity, two incredibly um, important public health problems that overlap to a substantial degree. Okay, these are my disclosures. Um, by the way, whoever wants my slides, you can have them, just let me know. Um, and I will, uh, I probably, depending on how things go, be discussing off-label uses of the following medications. Um, loraglutide and semaglutide, which are GLP-1 agonists. I might mention them in binge eating disorder. Metformin for psychotropic-induced weight gain. 
stimulants for maybe bulimia and topiramate for both bulimia and binge eating disorder. Okay, so mental disorders and obesity are each massive public health problems. These are data, these are pre-pandemic data. Um, so that um, with mental disorders, it's estimated that one in four to five adults and one in six youth um, have a mental disorder. And now, I don't know if you've, yeah, I, you've probably seen the studies where um, they're estimating that with the pandemic, rates of depression and anxiety have increase 25%. So these, this is the data I'm presenting are pre-pandemic data. Obesity is also a huge public health crisis. Um, in data from 2015 through 2016, nearly 40% of adults um, over 20 years of age and 18.5% of kids were obese. And what's really interesting is the incidence of obesity has increased by 70% over the past 30 years for adults and even more for kids. And we, and like I said, we think the uh, prevalence of mental disorders is increasing as well. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is how Many mental disorders are associated with obesity. Okay, so what, um, what are the ones we know? Well, eating disorders defined by binge eating are strongly associated with obesity. And this includes binge eating disorder, which I will talk a little bit more about, as well as bulimia nervosa. There's this myth that bulimia is associated with underweight. When in fact, the, the data we have suggests it's actually associated with overweight and obesity, especially people with the non-purging type. Mood disorders are strongly associated with obesity. This includes bipolar disorder, as well as major depressive disorder. And we think there are in particular certain forms of major depressive disorder that are associated with obesity. And that's people who have um, depression with atypical freak features, as well as suggestion of bipolarity. There is actually no doubt that people with chronic psychotic disorders have high rates of obesity. What's interesting is that people with anxiety disorders and even ADHD also have really high rates of obesity. So it almost like leads you to the question what mental disorders aren't associated with obesity. And when I ask that question and try to figure it out, those would be um, anorexia nervosa and then substance use disorders. But we have to understand this incredible close relationship between uh, psychi psychiatric disorders and obesity. I'm just gonna highlight a few disorders and their relationship with obesity. Okay, binge eating disorder. And I'll I will be talking more about binge eating um, later. This is, these are people who binge, but don't purge. We have pretty decent community data suggesting that 42% of people with BED in the community are obese. We do know that people who actually seek treatment for BED and there aren't many people um, are def, you know, almost always overweight or obese. And then in weight loss programs, very high rates of people have BED. Um, in fact, um, there's nice data to show that over you know, half or over half of individuals in a weight loss program with a BMI of over 40, which is severe obesity, have BED. And the other thing is, I'm not gonna really talk about this unless there's questions. You know, We have so many people seeking bariatric surgery and we think that anywhere from um, a quarter to a half of people seeking bariatric surgery have BED. Okay, so that's binge eating. Now, okay, here, and again, I'm gonna 
just give you examples of various disorders. Here is a, I thought it was a really cool study of um, weight and um, cases of obesity. This is a European sample of um, patients with either bipolar disorder or schizophrenia who are followed for 20 years. And it's just really interesting because if you look after 20 years of treatment, okay, 54% of people with bipolar disorder are obese. 62% of people with schizophrenia are obese. So there's clearly some sort of link here. Um, all right, these are data from, um, the, from United States National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, just showing that um, adults with depression are more likely to be obese than adults without depression. Um, and that's, you can see that in the total. And then if you look at gender, um, Women, this, this relationship is stronger in women than in men, but it's definitely present in men as well. Okay, I'm gonna now talk briefly about one of my favorite studies about the relationship between mental illness and obesity. Um, and this is a study from, I think England. And here, here was a headline advertising the results of the studies. The depression and double chances of becoming obese. Okay, let me just quickly show you some of the data. This is from um, a very important study, the Whitehall study. Um, and this was a 19 year prospective study of over 4,000 civil servants in London. Um, and they evaluated uh, common mental disorder caseness as defined as um, a G hey, GHAQ score greater than five. Importantly, height and weight were measured. In many studies of uh, psychiatric disorders and obesity, height and weight are not measured, they're reported. Well, the, the bottom line was um, the occurrence of a common mental disorder was associated with subsequent obesity in a dose response manner. In other words, the number, the greater the number of common mental health disorders people had, the greater the risk of obesity. Um, conversely, obesity predicted future common mental health disorders, but this association was lost when people with uh, common mental disorders were ex excluded at baseline. And I have a, okay, right. um, this is one of my favorite slides. It basically shows that the greater the number of common mental health disorders that you have at various phases in the study, um, evaluate, evaluated with a GHQ, which is not a skid, but it's still better than like a self-report. You know, it's, it's still at least a measurement um, that greater the number of common mental health disorders, the odds ratio for obesity versus having normal weight increased over time. <laughs> so that there was a very significant um, dose response relationship. Okay, why is there this relationship? Well, we know the usual um, explanations. We know people with mental illness, like people with obesity have poor dietary habits. We know people with mental illness as well as obesity um, have reduced physical activity. They engage in less exercise. Um, we know that psychiatric medications um, 
do have uh, substantial weight gain effects, but I think we need to go deeper than this and ask, um, can, some, can some mental disorders actually cause obesity? Um, and vice versa, could obesity cause some mental disorders? And I think it's important to realize that brain circuits involved in both overlap. Um, and moreover, genetic information suggests that there are shared genetic loci between these psychiatric disorders and obesity. So I guess what I'm gonna posit to you is that obesity may be a brain illness. Now, we've, we've, uh, we know it's not listed in the DSM-5 as a psychiatric disorder. And there, I think there are very good arguments for that, but is it a brain disorder? And so could you please keep that in, um, in your thoughts while I, I'm talking? So I think that's one thing I'm gonna argue. Obesity may be, it may not be a psychiatric disorder per se, but it's still probably a brain disorder. Um, here's a slide just showing the circuits involved with eating behavior. And there are two types of eating behavior. Um, there's homeostatic eating, which is, you know, you eat when you're hungry, you eat when your body needs it. And then there's um, what we call non-homeostatic or hedonic eating, which is basically eating for reward. Um, and you can see that the brain areas involved in these two aspects of eating behavior, um, particularly the um, prefrontal cortex, which is involved in non-homeostatic eating, you know, it, you know there's, there's definitely overlap between the brain circuits that control eating behavior and brain circuits that we think are involved in mental illness. All right, I'm not a geneticist, so I don't need to, but, but I think this is an important study. It was published in 2020, and um, it showed that there were, in fact, common genetic variants um, associated with BMI, schizophrenia, bipolar, and, and major depressive disorder. So, it, you know, there you know, there's, the relationship is deeper than whether or not you get a weight gaining medication. All right, all right. So now I'm gonna get back to clinical. So what are the implications over the overlap of mental disorders and obesity? Well, I argue that they're huge. Um, both conditions are associated with enhanced medical mor morbidity and mortality. Um, both are associated with disability. Both are associated with stigma. Both may, not always, may be associated with distress. And I like to point out that the obesity, to people who have both mental disorder and obesity, obesity can be more distressing than their mental disorder. We have a growing body of data suggesting that um, obesity is a source associated with a poor outcome in treating people with mental disorder. In other words, you know, obesity is probably bad for the brain. Um, and therefore, I guess I'm arguing that both need to be dressed clinically. Another way to look at it, this is another way I look at it, is that there's a number of overlapping conditions. Okay, so mood disorders, anxiety disorders, psychotic disorders, all overlap with obesity. Okay. And then we have obesity itself, and then we have eating disorder with binge eating, and then we have psychotropic induced weight gain. And it's important to realize it's sometimes hard to tease all this out, but that patients can have a number of these conditions. Um, and that the obesity, the binge eating, the psychotropic induced weight gain can 
definitely be more distressing to the patient than his or her mental illness and can result, uh, can produce non-adherence. So that treatment of people with mental illness with obesity requires knowledge in a number of domains. Obviously you have to know the psychiatric profile of psychotropic drugs, but you also have to know the effects of psychotropic drugs on appetite, eating behavior and weight. You have to understand um, the pharmacotherapy of obesity, um, including the psychiatric effects of weight loss drugs. You have to understand the treatment of binge eating, and you really need to understand the treatment of psychotropic induced weight gain. Okay, all righty. So let me get to a slide that maybe all of you are very familiar with, but unfortunately, a lot of psychiatric drugs cause weight gain and, and sometimes our most efficacious drugs, like clozapine and lanspine, that cause the most weight gain. But it's just, there's just no doubt about it that um, a number of psychotropics, and this lists a whole bunch, um, most antipsychotics, lithium, valproate, um, a lot of antidepressants, um, they increase appetite, increase weight, and they even increase, potentially increase binge eating, and I'll get back to that. Okay. Now, we do have some psychiatric drugs that are weight neutral or even associated with weight loss. Okay, Un antipsychotics. All right, I'm gonna date myself here. Um, every antipsychotic that I know about is associated with a little, at least a little weight gain. The exception may be molindone. And Dr. Rothschild, I don't remember if you remember Dr. Jonathan Cole telling us that the reason people who got molindone lost weight was because they had really bad akathisia. So yeah, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say. They were always moving. Well, and so, you know, if you increase somebody's physical activity, but I'll, I'll never forget that comment from Dr. Jonathan Cole. Now, the, I, I um, forgot to update this study that we now have an antipsychotic that is probably weight neutral, and that's lumateperone. And it's indicated for schizophrenia and bipolar depression. And the data are pretty good that it's weight neutral. All the other antipsychotics, though, probably uh, cause some degree of weight gain. Um, so, all right. So ADHD drugs, stimulants and atomoxetine, they cause weight gain, oh, weight loss. Mood stabilizers. I just think it's, if you treat people with bipolar disorder, I think it's extremely important that you're aware of the fact that lamotrigine is the only compound with any mood stabilizing properties that may actually um, reduce weight. A lot of it, so anti-epileptics are fascinating. Some cause weight gain, some cause weight loss. So, um, and then antidepressants. What I like to talk about with people is, is that, there, you know, there's one antidepressant that we know is associated with weight loss, and that's bupropion. Um, the data for fluoxetine are more mixed. We can talk about that later, but there's really good data that shows bupropion is associated with weight loss, including in people with obesity who don't have depression. And okay, um, for those of you, who know Dr. Charles Bowden, he was one of my mentors and he has recently died. He was, you know, just a phenomenal giant in bipolar disorder. He was um, responsible for getting both valproid and lamotrigine indicated for bipolar disorder. And this is one of the studies he did. Uh, it was a post hoc analysis of the, the studies of lamotrigine and bipolar disorder that led to Lamotrigine's um, approval. And it's, it's just, I think it's important to know about. Um, and so they looked at, they compared the effects on weight gain of Lamotrigine and lithium 
in non-obese patients as well as obese patients. Now in obese patients, there really wasn't a difference. But, okay, look, look what they found in obese patients. Um, placebos, weight neutral. Um, lithium did cause substantial weight gain, whereas lamotrigine caused substantial weight loss. So we can talk more about the important role of lamotrigine in bipolar disorder, not just because of its effects on bipolar depression, but because of, because of its uh, weight, weight, its effects on weight and metabol, metabol, meta, metabolism. Okay, and then, and then, you know, because so many patients say their antidepressants are causing weight gain, and maybe they are, but maybe they aren't. So I like to, you know, if I have, if I have a patient who's on an SSRI and they say they're gaining weight, I often switch them to propion, and, and, and it's because there are decent data that show that, um, Bupropion does significantly reduce weight in people who are obese without depression. We can talk about that more later. All right, let's, we're going to switch gears now and talk about treating most of the pharmacotherapy of obesity. Um, it's so common that, that every physician really needs to understand this. I am going to focus on pharmacotherapy. I'm not gonna talk about surgery, although I'm happy to take questions on that. And I just want to stress that lifestyle modification is crucial. It's the foundation of treatment of obesity. But I am gonna focus on pharmacotherapy because all these drugs, except for Orlistat, affect the brain. Okay, so here are the drugs currently approved by the FDA for long-term pharmacotherapy of obesity. Okay, everyone knows about Orlistat, and Orlistat is a, it doesn't affect the brain. It's a peripheral uh, pancreatic lipase inhibitor. Um, weight loss is not great. Okay, what are the other ones? We have the bupropion naltrexone combo, the fentramine to pyramate combo, we have loraglutide, and then we have Sexenda. All of these drugs, except for Orlistat, affect the brain. So I actually feel psychiatrists might be in the best position to, to treat obesity, particularly when it occurs with psychopathology. All right, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna show you just a smattering of study, of, of, of studies from um, the programs that helped get these drugs approved for obesity, because I think it's important to understand the effects of various psychotropics on weight. Um, I think this is a really cool study. Um, this study looked at, these took people with obesity who did not have a mental illness, and they got randomized to placebo, naltrexone alone, uh, bupropion alone, um, or various combinations of the two, um, with uh, NB48 being the highest dose of naltrexone. And you can see, naltrexone doesn't work in obesity. That's actually well known. Um, bupropion al alone, though, you, you got significant weight loss that was sustained. However, when you combine these two compounds, which are both, they're psychiatric drugs, you got more weight loss. Do we know why? Not really. But I, th I think it's important to know um, as a psychopharmacologist if you're dealing with uh, obese people. All right. Here is one of the preliminary studies looking at the combination of topiramate and fentermine um, for weight loss. And again, it's, it's really cool. I mean, 
and again, this is this like the preliminary study. It wasn't the study that led to the approval, but you know, placebo alone, you don't get a whole lot of weight loss. You get you know some weight loss with fentramine alone, some weight loss with topiramate alone, but you get substantially more weight loss with the combination. And here's one of the preliminary studies of the GLP-1 agonist, uh, liraglutide and obesity. And it, I'm just th the purpose of this is just to show that there is a dose response relationship uh, with the uh, amino liraglutide and the, the degree of weight loss. So the more liraglutide, sex, you know, uh, the, the greater the weight loss. And here, and here you can see Orlistat which is, you know, the weight loss with that is not nearly as good as with liraglutide. Okay, and here's, okay. This is the latest um, weight loss agent. It's semaglutide and obesity. Um, this is, there's like four or five studies leading to this approval. Um, the signal for reducing weight was, was incredibly strong. This is just one study. <clears throat> so you can see, you know, this is a study where patients were treated with some semaglutide um, in an open label manner for the first 20 weeks, and then they got randomized to uh, continue in semaglutide or they were switched to placebo, and you see this massive difference in weight. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert on the, it's just what's interesting to me is that um, apparently the weight loss with this compound actually approximates the weight loss you get with uh, bariatric surgery. And the company has not been able to keep up with the demand, but that's all I know. Okay, so switching gears. It's really crucial so if you're gonna be giving a weight loss drug to somebody with a psychiatric illness, you have to understand the psychiatric adverse event profile. Um, Orlistat, pretty benign, maybe a slight increase in anxiety. Bupropion, naltrexone combo, ah, maybe a little anxiety, little sleep disruption. Interesting, they've got a, day, a study showing you get actually less depression than with placebo, which sort of makes sense. No, S, no suicidal ideation, but you know the, the probability of mania and psychosis is still there. Fentramine to pyramate combo, insomnia, depressed mood, anxiety, and you can get mania and psychosis as well as birth defects. Now, what about the psychiatric adverse event profile of the GLP-1 agonists. And I'm gonna focus, you know, liraglutide three milligrams or semaglutide 2.4 milligrams a week, minimal, really minimal, which I think is really important. So, I, I really think it's important that psychiatrists know about glucagon-like peptide one agonists. These are really cool drugs. They're approved for type two diabetes and obesity. They clearly work in diabetes. They improve blood pressure, they improve lipids. Um, you get minimal hypoglycemia and there's clearly a dose dependent weight loss which is through decreased food intake. And um, it looks like there's definitely cardioprotective effects. So what is GLP-1? It's a gut brain peptide that's secreted from the intestinal mucosa in response to nutritional intake, um, but it is also located throughout the brain. Um, it decreases appetite, decreases energy intake, and it enhances satiety. It might also enhance neuroprotection. I think that needs to be researched further. And the cool thing is when you compare the um, 
neuro, the adverse neuropsychiatric profile of a GLP-1 agonist with other weight loss drugs, well, particularly, you know, um, ones that act on the brain, it, it's favorable. There seems to be low rates of suicidal ideation, low rates of mania, low rates of psychosis, and low rates of, of cognitive impairment. Okay. I'm just going to show a couple studies looking that have studied, um, actually, this is, this is with loraglutide in patients with severe mental illness and either overweight or obesity. Um, this study used the full dose of loraglutide, which is three milligrams per day. And you saw, you know, in, in patients with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, or first episode psychosis, and you saw nice reductions in body weight, uh, BMI, waist circumference, um, glycolated hemoglobin. Um, and, okay, what I'd like to point out is this last row here. Um, it was not significantly, it wasn't statistically significant, but there was a trend towards um, the, the overall level of psychiatric symptomatology to be reduced in the loraglutide group. Now, here is a similar study uh, looking at um, the loraglutide dose used in type two diabetes in patients receiving olanzapine or clozapine with overweight or obesity. And you see very similar findings. You see a nice reduction in body weight, BMI, systolic blood pressure. You know, see all these met other metabolic um, improvements. And if you look at the very bottom line, hospitalization worsening symptoms. Again, this is not a significant finding, but there is a trend for people who got liraglutide to not have to be hospitalized. So these are these two studies I feel are very important. They're both small because they were investigator initiated, but it, it raises the idea of if you successfully treat obesity in somebody with mental illness with a medication that doesn't exacerbate the mental illness, you know, can you actually you know, improve the mental illness? So. We don't know, but that's what I'm hoping. Okay, this is a, okay. Um, this is a study our group is doing. Um, we're looking at liraglutide in patients with bipolar disorder with obesity. Most studies of compounds in people with psychiatric disorders with obesity are in people with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. So we are doing study in bipolar disorder. We are we need one more person. So, and we're very. Um, Happy about our prelim. We we definitely we you know I've, we haven't broken the blind, but there are definitely people losing weight and people not losing weight. Okay, I'm going to switch gears now and talk about binge eating. All right, I feel binge eating is um, doesn't get the importance it really needs. Um, well, eating disorders in general have been blown off for years. So um, binge eating. So it's an incredibly important target symptom. It's extremely distressing for most people. Um, highly egotistonic, the patients don't wanna do it. And people are not gonna reveal that they do it unless you directly ask. Now, if you directly ask, it's amazing how often they will um, so yeah, I do that. The, um, psychiatrist who identified binge eating as an important symptom, Dr. Stunker, um, went on to say that it was a nonspecific symptom. Well, I think the data showed that that's really not the case. It's a, it's a very important symptom. It's extremely distressing. And it is strongly associated with um, not just obesity, but also mood and other eating disorders. 
Okay. Most of you know this, but I'm going to go over it because a lot of people don't. This is the DSM definition of a binge. I am not a DSM fan, but I do think this is a really good definition. Um, it's eating in a discrete period of time, um, a relatively large amount of food. Um, and during that period of time, you have, there's an, uh, a sense of lack of control over the eating. Okay, now what I like to mention about binge eating, okay, yeah, okay, so conditions characterized by binge eating, it's more than eating disorders. Okay, so binge eating, it's a core feature of binge eating disorder, it's a core feature of bulimia, it's an associated feature of anorexia, but it occurs in other conditions as well. So you see people who have obesity and subthreshold binge eating psychotropic induced weight gain. And I'll get back to that. Um, some of our um, antipsychotics induce binge eating. You see a lot of binge eating and polycystic ovary syndrome. And then there's a whole group of these um, either genetic or brain trauma induced forms of obesity where they have massive hyperphagia but when you read the hype, it, it's the, the hyperphagia is really very similar to a description of binge eating. So it's, it's a much more important syndrome, symptom than I think it gets credit for. And then here's, um, here's just one study um, that evaluated 74 patients with psychotic disorders who were getting clozapine or olanzapine. Uh, they evaluated them for binge eating. And guess what? Half of them had binge eating. Um, and in three quarters of the patients, binge eating began with antipsychotic exposure. I see this all the time. So, and then obviously binge eating was significantly associated with weight gain. Now, what's interesting when I have a patient who develops binge eating on an atypical, you know, I would love to be able to say they have a medication-induced eating disorder, but I don't. I just give them the regular eating disorder. But I, I just feel this is an incredibly important observation that's been neglected. It's an important reason why people stop their antipsychotics. Okay. All right. How do we treat binge eating? Just a really brief um, overview. There are psychological um, therapies. There tend to be very helpful for reducing binge eating. This includes cognitive behavior therapy, interpersonal therapy, behavioral weight loss management, even dialectical behavior therapy. All of these treatments appear to decrease binge eating behavior. What they don't seem to do is reduce body weight. So let me just say a little bit about the pharmacotherapy bulimia versus BED, there's only, <laughs> there's only two drugs approved for the treatment of eating disorders, which is really sad, you know? So we have fluoxetine approved for bulimia, and then we have lisdexamphetamine, which is a stimulant approved for binge eating disorder. We have tons of other data that suggests that, um, you know, topiramate may help reduce binge eating in both conditions. That's an off-label use. Um, stimulants might work in bulimia, again, an off-label use. Um, and even there's some preliminary data that this, the GLP-1 receptor agonist might also reduce binge eating. That's an off-label use. Okay. Let me just show you um, a little bit of data from the pivotal of uh, uh, Lizdex amphetamine studies and BED. This was <laughs> the most, this was the most incredibly positive study that I was ever involved with. These are the two phase three studies. And uh, you can just see that patients who were randomized to 50 or 70 milligrams of Lizdex amphetamine had a massively reduced rate of binge eating compared to patients who got placebo. But okay, so that's interesting. But I guess the other thing I wanna point out is that 
um, you had significant weight loss with Lisdex and Phenamine. I am not saying you should use the stimulant for obesity, but it's just, it's important to know what the data showed. Um, and this was the, um, we did a, a maintenance of response study. So patients with binge eating disorder uh, were re placed on Lisdex and Phetamine and then responders were randomized to either stay on Lisdex and Phetamine or go on placebo. And if you just look at weight, we, there was a lot of weight loss, not just in the open label phase, which, okay, let's forget that. But once they were randomized, you um, saw further weight loss with uh, Lisdex and Phetamine. So Lisdex and Phetamine, stimulants in general, they're not indicated for obesity, but at least in the development program, they were associated with weight loss in people with BED. So it's just an important thing to remember. And then here's a study I, I really like from a colleague of mine in Canada. Um, this was not a controlled study. People came in with binge eating disorder and they got randomized, just randomized to either get cognitive behavior therapy or methylphenidate. And again, it was, it was open label. And it was found that both treatments substantially reduced binge eating. There was no difference, but you did see substantially more weight loss with methylphenidate than CBT. All right, switching gears again. Okay, psychotropic induced weight gain. Huge problem. How do we treat it? While we know that dietary and behavioral counseling can be helpful, but it's often uh, really time intensive and costly. So what do we know about pharmacotherapy? Well, in, number one, nothing is FDA approved. Um, and when you read the guidelines to get FDA approval, it's just, it's huge. It's like getting approval for a drug for obesity and which is extremely, um, it's just really hard. But um, we have a number of drugs that might help. And I think what's interesting is we, we need to, so, so we have a number of drugs that help. If you get weight loss, you will often see metabolic benefits as, as well. And what's interesting is there, um, you know, there's this feeling or this, there's emerging evidence that you might want to start the drug sooner rather than later. Um, in other words, prevention might be easier than treatment. And I like to always tell people that, you know, once you develop obesity, it's like you grow another organ and it's very, you know, there's, you know, the body does all sorts of stuff to maintain that organ. So it's very, once you have obesity, it's very hard to lose weight because of the uh, mechanisms in the body that maintain it. All right, let me just say a little bit about pharmacotherapy of psychotropic induced weight gain. And again, nothing is approved. I First of all, I think it's important to set, show what's ineffective. Uh, SSRIs, ranitidine, and stimulants. <laughs> so stimulants might work in binge eating and they might relieve the obesity associated with binge eating, but they don't seem to work in psychotropic induced weight gain. In terms of, okay, a number of drugs have been reported efficacious. The two that have been the most studied and most consistently re reported to be helpful are metformin and topiramate. Here is a, it's an old meta-analysis, but it's, a, it's still the best. And um, it shows, you know, so first of all, it's got drugs on here that aren't available anymore. You know, defenfluramine, cybutramine, they're off the market. But if in terms of drugs that seem to work, it would be metformin and topiramate. By the way, I've never seen metformin work in binge eating. We can talk about that later. In terms of drugs that don't work, you know, deamphetamine and fluoxetine. So again, um, 
important area. This is, okay, so metformin. Um, a lot of, I have a lot of patients on metformin. I'm, I don't even know if it works or not. Um, um, but here are um, data from a really, really important study showing, um, comparing metformin with lifestyle intervention versus placebo in a lot of people with prediabetes. And you can see basically lifestyle intervention was better, but metformin was a little better than placebo, including change in weight. So is metformin a weight loss drug? I honestly still don't know. Now here, these are, I think, data that are important. This is a drug that's now come to market. Um, these are people, this is um, this is a study of olanzapine alone versus olanzapine plus semidorphin, which is an opiate antagonist. And what these data show is that patients with schizophrenia, um, treated with five milligrams of olanzapine, um, randomized to um, placebo or to receive semidorphin, which is again, opiate antagonist. Um, those patients who got semidorphin had 37% less weight gain. So just something to keep in mind. All right, so, all right, so let me, I'm about ready to conclude. Let me just talk about a few practical suggestions. I, you know, cause I'm somebody who treats people with severe mental illness and eating disorders. And, and there aren't too many people like me, um, but I like to remind people, uh, uh, clinicians that discussing eating behavior, dietary composition, physical activity, body image concerns are really important components of psychotherapy. We have a growing body of data suggesting that healthier diets, particularly the Mediterranean diet, is associated with less depression. I'm going to just, I will show you one slide on that. So I, I do recommend at this point, until we get more, we get better data, I recommend that my patients use the Mediterranean diet. I try to stress to people that exercise is really good for their brain and probably has antidepressant properties. And I do stress con concepts like mindfulness, including mindful eating. And I do talk with patients about satiety and how to embrace it. This is just a, a meta-analysis that got published in 2019, um, looking at associations between Mediterranean diet and depressive outcomes. And the data were pretty consistent showing that people who followed a Mediterranean diet were less likely to be depressed. So that's why I recommend a Mediterranean diet at this point till there's better data. Um, okay, so um, this is a brand new area. Um, I just want to talk about, you know, there are so many areas of research that we need. We need really good epidemiologic studies and the overlap of psychi psychiatric disorders and obesity where psychiatric disorders are determined with clinical interviews and obesity is measured. Because right now we have one or the other. And we know that people can misreport their weight. We desperately need randomized controlled trials of various compounds, you know, treatments or psychological treatments who, in people who have obesity with a psychiatric disorder. And I feel really strongly about this, although I don't think I'm gonna get anywhere with it. We desperately need randomized controlled trials of GLP-1 re receptor agonists and binge eat. I think that's it. Right. Um, Thank you very much, Sue, for the excellent presentation. We have a number of questions. Um, okay. And I took you up on your kind offer if people wanted the slides. Um, that, yeah, I, I'm happy to send them or you can send uh, them. 
Well, I put your email address in the chat function so people can just email you directly. And I, and okay, as time, I'm going through the talk, I noticed a few typos, so, okay. Yeah. Time for a few questions. What, a question about the impact of a history of uh, trauma and adverse um, early childhood experiences. Is that a factor increasing the likelihood, likelihood of both uh, chronic mental illness and obesity? Probably. Okay. Um, I'm not, I'm not a trauma expert. I'm not a PTSD expert, but I think the data are pretty solid showing that if somebody, okay, if somebody with bipolar disorder has a history of trauma, their bipolar disorder is more severe. And I think they've shown that people with obesity have fairly high rates of trauma. So um, I wish I could be uh, more, prof more professorial, but I would say, it's absolutely important and you have to take account of it. And so a lot of the patients I treat, you know, I, I, I'm old school, I do medication and psychotherapy, but a lot of these people, especially let's say if they have trauma or PTSD, I will get another therapist, so. Okay, is the weight loss effect of bupropion dose dependent or formulation dependent? Oh, that's a, that's a really cool question. Um, to my knowledge, it is not formulation dependent. Um, I think it, well, it is dose dependent because that was shown in, um, that, yeah, it's dose dependent, but it's not for To my knowledge, not, I'm not sure that's been tested, but yeah, I would say there is minimal data showing that you know, the greater the dose, the greater the weight loss. And that's in one of those slides I presented. Um, a questioner says that there have been reports that BMI increase is associated with clinical improvement on antipsychotic treatment, uh, <laughs> clozapine and, and olanzapine. Could you comment on this? I wish I could. Um, this is something that's always intrigued me. Um, I've always wanted to write a paper on it, but I haven't just dove down. But there is something about, you know, clozapine, there, there's something about drugs. You know, clozapine is associated with most weight gain followed by a lanspine. And they're probably the two best antipsychotics. Um, it's been explored. I don't have any good things to, I don't know how, I don't know how to, expand on that because I just, um, I don't know what to say. But what I can say is when I have a patient who's, you know, who, you're, you know, bad psychosis or bad bipolar and I have to have them on clozapine and they gain weight, I often add a GLP-1 agonist to help them lose weight and it doesn't seem to compromise the efficacy of the clozapine but that's strictly anecdotal. But well, I, you know, it's something yeah. I always wonder about. Yeah. Well, this was a great talk. I really liked your um, comments about the, effect that, the fact that these weight loss drugs can have effects on the brain. It reminds me of the, there was a pharmaceutical company that was working on the concept that when people smoke marijuana, they get the munchies. So that they were, devel they developed a drug to, uh, to um, hit the, <laughs> receptor and then it made people depressed. Uh, our group actually, okay, all right, I'm going to blank it. No, go ahead, go ahead. The CB, all right. So I know a little bit about that. Um, the cannabinoid receptor, I think they're agonists or anti, I can't remember, I think antagonists. We actually participated in some of those studies. Uh huh. And it was really interesting because they had me involved. Um, and yeah, you got weight loss with those drugs, but you got depression and right. suicidal ideation. Right. And I remember telling somebody once, you got to attend to this. And they didn't. And so the drugs either um, didn't, get never, didn't get approved or withdrawn. And now you see, you know, drug companies attend to uh, side effects of suicidality really carefully. Yeah. Well, that, that was really interesting. This, this was a fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Tony.